Hello my darlings, it's Zoe here and today we're uploading the first compilation of a full story. Well, I already said that multiple times on my community tab, but once I finish a story of multiple chapters, I will make a special video where I read the entire thing in one go. And today we're doing that. This is Remember Me, the Darby fanfiction. Hope you like it. But before we dive right into it, I know for a fact that this video won't get them a lot of views because it's a Darby story. So that makes it even more important that you share the video around, like or dislike. And I know it's a little bit difficult because the video is really long, but please watch it until the end. This is the best way you can support me indirectly, because this way you support me in the YouTube algorithm. If you support me in the YouTube algorithm, YouTube will eventually pay me a little bit more. So. Please make Susan pay me more. Thank you. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, lastly, if you want to support me more directly, because you know that I will get a certain amount of money or, or you're just feeling very generous, I have a merch store and a Patreon. Both links are down in the description. I also have a Discord. So if you want to make fan art, for example, you can send it right there. And if your fan art is exceptionally good, I might even put it at the start of my video. Now, now for some extra encouragement that you properly support me, please, God, please, uh, I brought back the cute animal picture of the day. Just look at your little fella. Don't you just want to throw your money at them? Please. Enjoy the show. Let's get right into it. Have I ever talked about my quirk? Hmm? Your boyfriend Darby gave you a dumbfounded look. You smile. He will not understand. He cannot understand. Up until now, the two of you had spent an amazing night out. Due to a civil unrest in Camino Ward, the police had been busy for days now, allowing you and the rest of the League to roam free, at least for now. As Shigaraki had put it, If we lay low enough for them to do their silly little riots, we will be forgotten until this blows over. So no crimes, and enjoy being an enormous villain for the time being. Of course, Toga hated that. But her boyfriend kept her in check. Especially since this was such a special occasion, Tomura wasn't often the kind of leader to give such a mature order. And tonight certainly was a strange occasion. Darby and you had been out on the town drinking, having fun. Because tonight was the night you would leave him. Hopefully not for long. You two had found yourself on top of one of the many skyscrapers. The skyline of the city created a breathtaking, colorful, neon background. You took a step back to give him a sweet smile. What are you talking about? He gruffed at you. It hurts, you know. He took a few steps forward to lean over the railing deciding to let you tell him at your own pace. Suddenly, a single drop of water landed on his leather jacket, and he looked up. It's gonna rain. We should probably head inside. No, we shouldn't. You giggled. His gaze went over to you. You twirl around, seemingly trying to catch as much rain as possible. He walked closer to you, smile on face. How about a dance? Once again you giggled as he took your hands. The rain picked up, creating a chaotic rhythm. Soon you found yourself pressed against his chest. You were in an almost dreamlike state. The colors of the city merging together as the rain fell onto your eyes. Why do you love me? You whispered into a scarred ear. He 
He thought for a moment, muscles remaining in a relaxed state, while he was cartoonishly thinking out loud. However, he noticed you felt lighter than you were a few moments ago. You're my pixie dream girl. Always your head in the clouds. I don't even know why you hang out with us. He chuckled. With your attitude, you should be a hero. But you dine with the bad guys. <laughs> I love you, Darby. You mumbled loud enough for him to hear. The rain by now had soaked both of you completely. So, what was this about your quirk earlier? His words made you drift into an abyss of emotions. You stared at an undefined spot behind him before you began. When I was just a little kid, you took a deep breath. I died when my quirk manifested, without me knowing. He slowly let go of you, while his face turned into a questioning grimace. Uh, I know you wouldn't understand. Silly. Just let me finish. You gently rubbed your hand against his cheek. My quirk killed me, but my quirk is also what's keeping me alive. You've wrapped your body closer around his before continuing. I remember it only vaguely. But I think me and my parents went to the doctor because I stopped feeling pain. Darby didn't know what to think. For the first time in his life, he was speechless. My heart didn't beat anymore. And my body was cold. So cold. You didn't know if the water in your eyes was from the tears or the rain. You felt his arms tighten around you. And one day, my body turned to ash. That was when my quirk fully activated. I was alive. And yet I was not. My quirk is called the shape. It is a formless mass made up of my memories, feelings, and personality. You chuckled, but it sounded more like a choke. So, what does this have to do with us? You gave him a somber giggle. My quirk is called the shape. In my other form, I can enter a person's body. Then my memories and personality override the original. Technically, it isn't murder, but also it is, you see, you sighed. My quirk sucks out the body it is in, mummifying it over time from the inside. I thought since this girl I'm currently inside of could survive longer. A quirk is called nourish. Allowing her to take nourishment from any source of food. This includes even inedible things. But alas, I can fear this body won't be long for this world. Tabby whimpered. But you'll come back, right? To me. A downside to all this. I guess is, is nature's way of killing me eventually is that the longer I'm without a body, the more memories I lose. You felt a sting inside your chest upon saying that. If I can't find a suitable body, I will just vanish into nothingness. Darby shivered. He could not imagine the horror he must feel in this moment. So in a way, I'm a villain for selfish reasons. I want to make many memories, to increase the time I can look for a body I like. That sad chuckle left your lips. I don't even remember if I was a boy or a girl. My real name, where I was born, not even who my parents were. You chuckled darkly. 
I only know that I prefer living as a girl. So I choose girls over boys. An intense pain made itself known to you. And slowly you began losing the feeling in your limbs. I love you, Darby. But I feel this is it. No. Finally you could muster the courage to look at him. It isn't your fault. It's my fault. You said. Oh, that's... That's not fair. I... There must be something I can do. You ruffled through his hair. You would miss that until you would forget. There's no guarantee I will return. What if I forget you? What if you have moved on when I find a body? And what if I vanish into the cold embrace of death? His arms tightened more. It was starting to become hard to breathe. He was hoping if he just held onto you hard enough, you could stay. It's not your fault, Darby, he repeated. You have been a gentleman to me. Kind, compassionate. Compassionate is something virgins tell guys they friends on. He grumbled. I love you. He said with more power in his voice. As if saying this would make you not destroy this vessel you are in. Suddenly your body surged with pain. And you gasped. No, don't go. He pressed his head into your chest. Just please. You whispered weakly. Don't let go of me. He felt your hand drop over his back one last time. I'll wait for you. He cried into your crumbling chest. I will wait until the end of the world. Your mouth formed the words, it hurts, but no sound was leaving your throat, as it had already turned to dust. He remained like this, holding your clothes, only now allowing himself to cry. That was until he felt the presence behind him. And he turned to see. A white mist had formed next to him. It had a vague human shape. Something that seemed like arms were outstretched. He put the clothes on the ground and stood up. After he raised his own arms, the shape came closer, embracing him. He felt something. He wasn't sure if it was a good feeling or a bad feeling. But he knew one thing. That right now, the thing in his arms was you. A weightless mist made up of nothing but memories. Tears rolled down his face as he realized this right here was him hugging you. The real you. For the first time. And then. You are gone. With quivering lips. He walked up to the railing of the rooftop. Desperately searching. And somewhere. He thought he could make out. A somewhat human shaped cloud. Floating in between the cards. Four weeks passed. Darby was lying on the sofa in the League's headquarters. His head clouded from alcohol. The stuff was slowly becoming less and less powerful. The empty bottles towered on the small coffee table next to him. 
shaking dangerously whenever someone moved too close to them. Toga sat on the floor next to Darby, chewing on her lower lip. Her boyfriend, who the media called The Unbroken, was sitting at the bar, drinking some drink or giri mixed for him. Darby's body suddenly shook up. And Toga looked at him. Is she back yet? No, said Toga with a straight face. On your back, Toga. The young girl jumped on her feet and looked down at Darby. What do you want from me? With the speed of a snake, Darby was on his knees, clutching Toga's shirt. I want her back, Toga. I, I don't want to live without her. He shook her. Tell her she's coming back. Please, just say baby, please. I need to hear it. Toga looked over at her boyfriend who was looking at them. He simply nodded at her before returning to us alcohol. Careful. Gentle. She combed through his hair. Maybe, she said. Let's hope she will come back. You think? Yes, she said in a cheerful tone. His grasp weakened as he slumped back onto the sofa. Has he fallen asleep? asked Korgiri. Mm-hmm, was Toga's reply. While Darby had been drowning his sorrows in alcohol, he had been wandering floating, seeing the world through the eyes of something weightless, your mind slowly forgetting your past and present, your name, your family, your friends, you try to focus on what was real and what wasn't, chased by the echoes of what was. That was until you saw her. A vessel perfectly suited for you. She was pretty. She was small. She was very beautiful. You didn't remember why you wanted to be beautiful, but something urged you to choose an attractive body over a more useful one. However, this one was seemingly both. You had watched her for a while now. Despite your constant memory loss, making you wonder for whomever you wanted to look pretty for, would they like it? If not, you are about to ruin the life of a perfectly healthy young girl. You dealt it on your side as you watched her train through a window. Her quirk was based around electricity or energy. It even allowed her to float gracefully. You wondered how long it would take for you to learn this. She didn't have many friends despite her popularity. Most were just admirers. This might become a problem, but it wasn't the first time your chosen body was a popular woman. All you really needed was a change of clothes, colored contacts, and a new hair color. Yes, you imagined all of it. Your perfect new body. Hopefully this one would last longer. You would certainly take good care of her. That's what you silently promised to yourself. Her, and the mysterious feeling that wanted you to take a pretty vessel. Carelessly, you floated over to the girl's dorm. You had lived like this for a very long time. This was your quirk. A mutation. It was scary the first few times around, yes. But once you had accepted it, it had become easier. But that didn't change how wrong it was. Your ethereal body 
would suck out the energy of anything you inhabited, to the point where the body would quickly expire and turn to dust. This technically meant that you could live eternally if it wasn't for your memory loss. The more time you spent outside a vessel, the more memories you would forget. A natural decay. And if you would take too long choosing a body, you certainly would forget how to move, to see, to think. And then you would join the clouds in the sky as nothing but mist, caught in an everlasting dream of absolute nothingness. She entered the girl's bedroom through a crack in her window and nestled under a bed. And there you waited. You let your mind wander. And you wanted to remember why all of this was necessary this time. The sun had begun to set when you finally saw a vision. A forest. Not remembering its surroundings, it was simply floating on a cloud. Inside this forest stood a cabin. Voices were coming from it. Sweet noises. Warm voices. Oh, how much you wanted to enter it. But before that you needed to remember where you were and who you were to these people and who you would become in the next few hours. The door to the girl's room opened, and what you saw filled you with warmth. It was the girl and her two friends, a strong, dreamy-looking lad, and a sad little elven-looking worm with pretty hair. If it wasn't for a female vessel that you desired, you would have taken the little worm. His quirk allowed him to gain abilities through consumption of food. Him and the girl were just perfect. Just imagining being able to be them for more than a year, thanks to their quirks, made you feel at ease. The three friends were talking about another girl. A friend, maybe? Or a peer? But once that girl's quirk came up in the conversation, your ethereal heart fluttered. The girl's quirk also sounded absolutely perfect for your intention of survival. This place you had found was so wonderful. Once you had the body of this bubbly, floaty girl, you were certain to burn this place into your memory. It was like looking at a wonderful meal but only able to choose one thing. Finally, the boys left. You watched the girl walk around her room, see how she acted all alone. She was so pretty. You wanted her body. You needed her body. But you needed to be patient. Until... Until... The lights in the girl's room turned off, and you heard creaking above you. And then silence. Slowly, gently, you floated upward. Now seeing this girl in full view up close for the first time, she was cuddling with a teddy bear while mumbling. You had seen the crown in her room before. She had won a beauty pageant. She deserved it. You deserved it. And now your thoughts were filled with hunger. But you wanted to be patient. You could live in her for years, most likely. And because of that, you wanted to grant her mercy. The mercy of sleep. The only mercy you could grant this perfect little girl. Once her eyes began to move under her eyelids, it was time. Your misty form embraced her sleeping body, allowing her to slowly inhale you. You were glad she was asleep. 
If you would have to force yourself down on her body, she would fight you, scream and bite, and your heart simply could not take that. Not another time. The procedure only took a moment. There was no fighting back. And then, the girl was no more. You told yourself over and over that the people you subsumed were not really dead. But the more often you did it, the more you realized that, outside of a few select memories of theirs that remained in your head, there was less than nothing left of who they once were. You opened your eyes, feeling rejuvenated. For a moment you hugged the girl's teddy bear closely. I'm sorry, little one, you said quietly. Wow, your new voice was so gentle. But your owner has to go on a journey. You looked at the teddy bear, misty-eyed. Are you sure, Mr. Bear? You kissed the stuffed toy on the forehead. Thank you. The bear would stay put and tell the girl's friends that wherever she was, that she was happy. Gently you jumped up on your feet and then covered up the teddy bear up to his head. Good night. I'll be thinking of you, Mr. Bear. You tapped your chin. Oh, I apologize. You said to the bear. Good night. I'll be thinking of you, Mr. Fred. The name fitted the bear, and you were glad he told you. You walked into the girl's bathroom, admiring your new form. You liked slender bodies like hers. Then you gently touched the girl's toothbrush. Dry. That wouldn't do. Who doesn't brush their teeth before going to bed? Following through with your promise of taking good care of her body, you began brushing your teeth. You giggled once the toothpaste-covered brush touched your teeth. She liked strawberry toothpaste. You preferred fruity toothpastes yourself. It was a shame you could only get those in the children's aisle at grocery stores. Once you were done brushing, you took a nice, warm shower. And changed into more comfortable clothes. Then you began searching through the girl's personal belongings. You needed money. All of it. Oh! What's that? You exclaimed when a pink brick fell into your hands. A giggle escaped you. It was the girl's phone. You gave it two attempts at opening before the teddy bear told you the password. Thank you, Freddy. Uh, can I call you Freddy? You blinked. <laughs> Thank you, Freddy. After unlocking the phone, you searched for the girl's and now technically your messages until you just quickly turned it off, feeling guilty over what you did. She really had been a good person. You sat back down on the bed. What was it? You looked to your left. There laid a little All Might action figure. Oh, hey All Might, you said with a smile. No, no, I'm fine. Just feeling a little sad. You tilted your head. Yes, All Might. The forest. You're right. Maybe they remember the last time I had a pony. You patted the edge configure on the head. Tell Freddy I'm going now. I don't want to see him all sad when I'm leaving. Joyfully, you clapped your hands. Thanks, Mr. All Might. Quickly now, with newfound determination, you collected the essentials. The girl had snacks stored in her nightstand, and a few bottles of a pink soda. Then you grabbed the girl's wallet and the backpack you had stuffed the snacks in, before throwing away her ID and student card. Then, putting all the money you could find into her wallet, it 
still didn't feel like it was enough. Huh? What was that, Mr. All Might? He looked back at the action figure. Ah, yes. Goodbye, Mr. All Might. You grinned and left the room. Leaving the building wasn't hard. The girl you had chosen was the third year of this neat little high school. And thankfully, third years didn't have a curfew. Something that might change after tonight. She used the girl's quirk to gently float over the school protective walls. And then you were free. Before turning away, however, you focused as hard as possible on the school building. His body was sure to fall apart at some point. And the school had unbelievably powerful quirk users. Which would allow you to gain new vessels fast and easy. After thoroughly concentrating and a mild headache, you continued walking into the opposite direction of the large building. You traversed the nightly city without much hassle. In fact, you got a few compliments from the various drunkards about your looks. And they were quite enjoyable and helped your fragile ego. Sadly, however, they didn't help you trigger any hidden memories. You played with the idea to allow yourself be taken by them just so in the morning after you could steal from them. But that feeling in your gut told you to avoid men, at least for now. You aimlessly walked throughout the city until the sky turned into an uncomfortable twilight. It was getting morning. Wanting to see the sunrise, you decided to race into the factory district with all its abandoned skyscrapers. The sun was almost over the horizon when you arrived. Without much thought, you chased into the first one that was open, past obscene graffitis, and with a heavy beating heart, you chased up the stairs. Finally, you opened the door leading to the roof. Except, it wasn't the morning sun that greeted you. It was still the same roof, but the sky above you was dark, and two silhouettes were standing at the railing. Intrigued, you walked towards them, hearing distant voices. Suddenly, one of the shadowy figures fell onto its knees. Oh no, she's hurt! You exclaimed as you stepped forward. But you were too late. The kneeling figure had begun to fade away. I... I'm sorry I didn't tell you sooner, Darby. You cried out, now falling on your knees yourself. Tears were streaming down your face. Who was Darby? You thought as the memory faded. This building. This memory. Instinctively, you must have chosen this building. This Darby must be the reason as to why you wanted to remember so badly. Why you wanted to choose a beautiful vessel. By now, you had forgotten the sunrise completely and wandered over to the spot where your old self had vanished. Leaning against the railing, looking out into the city below you, you needed to find him. With your head hung low, you made your way back down, your feet beginning to hurt from your endless walking. You spent the entire day worried sickly about your vision, Worrying if this Darby character even remembered you, who he was, if he was handsome, and if he treated you well. Clearly you cared enough about him to the point where you wanted to look pretty for him. Without realizing it, you found yourself in the subway of Camino Ward. It was still too early to be ram-packed with people so you decided to spend these last few peaceful moments 
of buying a candy bar at the vending machine. Seeing your reflection in the machine's glass suddenly made you feel very aware of not only the life you had taken to be here now, but also the life you had lost when you faded into nothingness the last time. Strangely, however, it didn't make you feel sad, nor happy. Just very, very empty. You wondered, what would Freddy say in this moment? And did he still think you were his original owner? And what did All Might tell him to cheer him up when he realized you wouldn't come back? Pushing the thoughts aside, you opened the wrapper of the candy bar. And you growled. You had forgotten the candy bars in your backpack. With a scowl, you ate the white chocolatey treat as you walked back to the surface. Just when you had taken your last bite, you remembered the forest floating on a sea of clouds. The clouds were probably just your imagination, but that didn't change the fact that you hoped there was a floating forest island somewhere in the world. You didn't even need to see it. Just knowing it existed would be enough. You giggled when you thought about flying pigs and cows living on it. Then your phone rang and you pulled it out. For a moment you thought of answering it and realizing that that was the worst idea you had all day and the day had just started. But the loud cheerful tone would certainly make people as uncomfortable as you felt right now. So you just swiped it away. Wait. Phone. You thought as numbers seemingly out of nowhere appeared in front of you. You bit your lower lip and quickly rushed forward into a nearby park. The numbers, what do they mean? You repeated in your head. If you could remember any number of your past life, you could get a connection to the people you were looking for. While the numbers kept floating around your head, whenever they stayed the same, for just a moment, you clicked it into the phone. First attempt. Nothing. And on the second attempt, a deep male voice spoke. Who's there, Ribbit? And you answer with, Hello, is this Darby? No, this is the Asui residence. You got the wrong number, Ribbit, Ribbit. Oh, okay. Sorry, magical frog. Goodbye, you said before hanging up. The fourth number you tried worked as well. Hello. Another male voice. Hello. You answered, followed by silence. Who's there? groaned the voice. It's me. Look, pal. The last person to pull this prank on me was my girlfriend. And she's dead. So tell me where the fuck you are so I can put you on a pyre. How did you even get this number, asshole? You tilted your head, ignoring his loud mouth. Are you Darby? Silence. Are you Darby? You repeated after a while. I... What? There was something in his voice. Something familiar. Do you know a Darby? I'd like to meet him. Yes, yes, I, I, I'm Darby, he stuttered. Cool, you exclaimed happily. I think we were a couple once, you said with a giggle. Who is that Darby? You heard a female voice in the background. Are you cheating on me? You asked with a smile. No, no, that's, uh, that's just Toga. You could hear fighting coming from the phone's speaker. And then you heard the girl again. Dabby is currently unavailable. He is... The girl Toga went quiet for a second. He's crying and is saying your name over and over again. Oh, 
we answered. Anyways, if it's really you, our location hasn't changed. What location? Toga gave a quick chuckle. Our base, silly! You shuddered in anticipation. Base? Was I part of a cult? I love cults, especially the ones that serve fancy drinks. Toga laughed loudly. <laughs> it's not a cult. It's a family. A metaphorical one. He was smiled happily. It still sounded like a cult. Are you smiling? Asked Toga and you nodded. I'm guessing you nodded. <laughs> she giggled. I know you too well. Okay, the Bex is still in the forest at the Tatooine district. Where are you? You looked around yourself. A park? Silence. Then go from the park to the Tatooine district. And then fight the forest. It's at the city's boundaries. Toga, wait! You heard the voice of Darby. Before you hand up, tell her I love her and that I've thought about her every night. Again there was shuffling. Darby says he wants to take your new body's virginity really, really badly. Toga! shouted Darby. And then the line cut. Absent-mindedly, you began walking, quietly telling your feet to go to the Tatooine district. It took you almost the entire day. Of your own obliviousness, you had forbidden yourself to eat. But mostly it was because of the lack of money. Everything was just so expensive. You didn't dare to buy anything. Afraid you would see something you really, really like and by then have wasted your money on stuff you didn't need. With a growling tummy, you arrived at the outskirts of a rural forest. Houses half-hazardly scattered around. Eventually, with a growling tummy, you arrived at the outskirts of a rural forest. Houses half-hazardly scattered around. Stark contrast to the city you walked around in just mere minutes ago. You only realized the dumb mistake you were making as you thoughtlessly walked into the dark, creepy forest while the sun was setting once you were hopelessly lost. Despite that, the image of the cozy cabin was floating inside your head. And you had been drooling with anticipation ever since. You imagined the large forest as a dungeon, filled with danger. And the cottage as the treasure chest filled with the friends of your last life. And the ever-increasing onslaught of orcs and goblins seemingly guided you to safety. You walked through dark passages and carefully crawled over dangerous bridges, hanging above pools of acid until you reached a large wooden door. Surely your treasure would be behind it. After opening it, you gave a surprised squeak. You saw a grandiose wooden treasure chest with golden ornaments and a tiny door leading to its inside. But in front of the chest stood a mean-looking orc, his head shaven, eyes white as snow and his bald head was covered in white war paint. And his toned abs were blackened by charcoal. But he didn't attack you outright. He simply tilted his head upon seeing you. What do you want, Yumi? said the orc. I'm here to meet my friends, you said with an innocent smile. I'm Yorak keeper of the treasure. What makes you think you can enter? I asked you nicely. You replied. The grotesque orc scratched the back of his head dumbfoundedly. Uh, Can I please go into the chest to meet my friends and prince? I've never met such an adventurer, said the orc before opening the door for you. And as soon as you took your first step into the chest, the wonderful image turned back to reality. He looked to your right. There stood Twice. I remember you. Your name is Twice. 
uh, where did Gorak go? You asked the masked man. Look, Dolly, I don't even know who you are. Actually, I know who you are. I miss you so much. Sadly, there is no Gorak here. He squealed. And you shrugged. Maybe the old orc had something else to do. Humming happily, you waltzed into the large living room of the abandoned house the League of Villains called its home. Hey, where's Darby? You asked into the almost empty room. With the exception of twice and a large shadowy figure behind a bar, the room was completely empty. And who are you, may I ask? Asked the shadowy figure with a perplexed tone. I'm me! You answered with a cheerful grin. And the man sighed. <sighs> his girlfriend. Got it. Darby's in his room. Let me summon him. So, was Darby a demon? Your grin widened. Your past boyfriend was a demon. You really were a lucky girl. And the purple mist man vanished behind a door. She... She's what? You heard a familiar voice shout. The door swung open once again. A man with a patchwork body and face rushed into the room. He was wearing an open leather jacket with nothing under it and black sweatpants. His face was overjoyed. Is, is it really you? He asked. I, I, I think. I think it's me, yes. He answered with a giggle. With three long steps, he was right in your face. Up close, he was so much bigger than you. You barely reached his shoulders. And then, you felt two arms embrace you. Your face squeezing against his chest. I missed you, he said as tears ran down his face. How much do you remember? You shrugged. Doesn't matter, he sniffled. Doesn't matter. I love you. I still love you. He was getting hysteric. I think, you began. I think I love you too. The next morning you sat with Toga at the breakfast table. She was happily stuffing her face with the candy bars you had forgotten in your backpack. When Darby entered the room. Slightly burned newspapers in hand. Hey, he said to you with a smile. And you answered with a happy grin. Guess what? What? Wait, are we getting a unicorn? You asked and Toga squeaked. Wait, are we? shouted the blonde. Darby sighed. No, but... He opened the newspaper. There was an image of you with the words missing under it. Guess we gotta change your face up a bit, chuckled Darby. And you groaned. Freddy was supposed to tell them that I'm fine. You pouted. Who's Freddy? asked Darby perplexed. Who cares? You got your pixie back. <laughs> Left Toga with a white grin. The next few days went on slowly as you regained the memories of the life you had lived just mere weeks ago. That was until you had a very strange dream. The sun had started to set. Your eyes moved towards the horizon where sun and water kissed, drowning the world around you in a beautiful twilight. The days went on slowly. You regained the memories of the life you had lived a few weeks ago. That was, until you had a very strange dream. The sun had started to set. Your eyes moved towards the horizon, where sun and water kissed, drowning the world around you in a beautiful twilight. You are walking on top of a cliff, looking at the countryside. Trying to find that one perfect spot between a couple of bushes. 
You remember walking this path many times, and every time you had been alone. So your body froze up for a moment when you noticed a figure dangling their legs over the cliff. After you crawled through the protective fence of shrubbery, you noticed the stranger wasn't much taller than you, and you called out to them. They turned their attention towards you. They had a weird face. It was blurry. The voice sounded distorted. Yet their eyes remained. These striking blue eyes. What are you doing at my spot? He asked the stranger, as he approached with a smile. He replied with more distortion, and you chuckled. I asked you first. For a moment there was silence between the two of you. Well? The distorted wails of the stranger reached your ears, sounding somber. As they talked, you continued approaching them. May I sit? You asked them after reaching the cliff's edge. Thank you. Your gaze wandered back to the horizon. So, now I know what you're doing here, so tell me why you're here. The stranger spoke, none of his noises sounding like words, yet your heart sank. Your father, huh? Is that why your eye looks so weird? The stranger moved one of his hands up to cover the right half of his face. Don't worry, my dad passed me once too. Like only one. You reply to the distortion, as both of you went silent. What's your name? He asked after a while, when the first stars appeared. Julia Todoroki, said the stranger, followed by more distorted sounds. Nice name. Mine is... Now it was your turn with these strange sounds of distortion, as your vision became nothing but a deep, dark blur. You opened your eyes slowly. Your dreams were always like this. Random jumbles of the countless memories you amassed inside your head. You wondered only for a moment where you had ended up as you rolled on your side. Next to you lay the blonde girl, her eyes open. In her hands was presumably her phone. When she noticed you staring, she turned towards you and grinned. Hey, Sleepyhead, getting used to your new body? New body? Oh, I was right. You took over this girl's body after your quirk had destroyed the last one. What was this girl's name again? Something with an N. Toga, you said, pointing a finger at her, and the girl chuckled. <laughs> yes, I'm Toga, she said with a grin. Okay, now I'm no, I'm not sleeping, you said as you rolled on your back. Are we still the bad guys? You asked. Yep, answered the girl. What was I doing yesterday? You asked. The girl shrugged. You called twice an orc again, and then you ran around the forest until you reached its edge. Uh, then you got lost, and we needed to send Dabi to pick you up. You blinked. I wasn't in a forest. You said with confusion. I was in a labyrinth, and a minotaur was chasing me. A, a really tiny minotaur. But... He was also a really tiny minotaur. Toga blinked. You were this type of crazy she loved to deal with, and definitely the type of crazy Darby found attractive. But it's good to know I'm awake now, he said with a soft smile as he jumped out of bed. 
Your gaze shifted to the digital clock on the nightstand. It was 10 a.m. Time for breakfast. The most important meal of the day. For some undescript reason. After all, you were more hungry in the evening. When you reached the kitchen, you poured yourself cereal. Only noticing you forgot the milk two bites in. You had just finished soaking your delicious cereal friends when your boyfriend entered with a yawn. <sighs> hey, how's it going? He said with a smile as he walked up to one of the freezers. At the fridge of the lodge, the leak of villains was using was broken. So Korgiri had gotten a free battery-powered portable freezers from somewhere. His hand had just touched the butter when you spoke up. Morning, Kyoya. Your boyfriend froze. What did you just call me? Kyoya, your name's silly. You giggled. Darby didn't expect to be caught by that name today. Especially not by you. Right. How did you know? What was happening? Having lost his appetite and hunger, he turned towards you. Eyes widened, and you tilted your head. What's wrong? He blinked, and with a deadpan expression asked, My name is Darby. Who taught you that name? Oh, that's right, Darby. You forgot. Sorry, I forgot. You know how I am. You blushed, and he shook his head. Why did you call me that? You grinned. I had a dream. Probably not just a dream. He searched through his long suppressed memories, thinking of every instance where he told someone his actual name. Where? He asked more to himself than to you. On a cliff! Suddenly his skin turned white, and tears formed in his eyes. Without saying another word, he stormed out of the kitchen. With confusion, you looked around the room, unsure of what to do or say. Then you looked down at your cereals. Huh? What was that? He asked your milk-bathing friends. You smiled at them when you heard their reply. Okie dokie, you said before happily munching down on them. After finishing your breakfast, you began wandering the house, looking for your boyfriend. When you couldn't find him, you became worried. So you approached the only sensible person for these kinds of situations. Toga, I can't find Darby, you said while bursting into the room. The both of you occupied. What? she asked. She was still fixated on her phone, but had changed her position from the bed to a chair in the corner of the room. We talked while I was eating, and then he just left. My cereal told me not to worry, but I think they lied to me. Uh, suicidal people have the tendency to do that. Toga blinked. Uh... You were the only person to ever get her speechless. She had begun wondering if the insane ramblings coming from you were what she sounded like to others. I don't know? She asked. But we can find him. I think I'm good at finding odd guys. You tilted your head. Was that a pun because of his quirk? Or did you just call him hot because, well, he is? She giggled. <laughs> Both. Then you two went on searching outside. For some reason, the dungeon around the cabin had turned into a forest overnight. It was as if the surroundings were just as unsure of how they would look like as you were of your own memories. Leave no stone unturned. He knows too much. If he gets captured, this place will be sprawling with cops, said Toga. Oh, okay, you said as you crouched down, picking up a pebble from the ground. Dabby? you asked. He isn't here. Toga blinked. Oh, she said. No, 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 Dabby doesn't hide under pebbles, she mused. Well, yes, a pebble would certainly be a good hiding spot, considering how many pebbles there are in this forest. He's too deep for that, and he's probably hiding somewhere that is more symbolic to him. 
Duke thought for a moment. Like a campfire? Toga drifted into thought for a moment. Why, that is a good idea. Uh, someone with a fire quirk would definitely be tempted to hide there. I don't think it's significant enough for him. Yuto continued searching until you and Toga ran into Krogiri. My apologies, but have you two seen Mr. Dabi? Tomura Shigaraki wishes to converse with him. Toga squealed. Oh, this is perfect. You two can look for Dabi here, and I look for him on social media. You raise an eyebrow. Since when can he upload himself onto the internet? Toga giggled. <laughs> Honestly, I just want an excuse to go back home. That made sense, actually. After Toga was gone, Kurogiri confronted you. Explain to me what happened. You explained the situation. Interesting. He started. Are you aware of the possible consequences, my dear? Consequences? You asked. Korogiri chuckled darkly. <laughs> Dobby is a wanted criminal, like pretty much everyone in the League. This body you inhabit is a missing UA student. He paused as the realization of all this hit you square in the chest. Gently he placed his hands on your shoulders. Listen to me, little one. Darby knows too much. Darby is too important for the League. If he gets captured, this entire operation goes to the... He really wanted to say dogs. He knew, however, how to talk to you. If he were to finish a sentence as he intended, you'd lose your focus immediately. Goes to hell. Do you want to go to hell? Your lips quivered. N no The shadow nodded. Great. Now, I'm going to ask something of you. For just a tiny bit. It is something very important. You gulped but kept listening. To find Darby, you need to return to reality for just a tiny moment. Search for your memories until you can tell me where he most likely will be. You blinked. What? The man closed his eyes and explained. I know life hasn't told you. I'm well aware of the fact that life has dealt you very bad cards. I know your childish behavior is a shield to protect yourself from your own sins. So you can live with yourself. And I'm not asking you to stay in reality. I fully understand how hard it must be to get there in the first place. I just need you to focus for a single, rational thought. Your body tensed. And your heartbeat increased, your eyes becoming watery. His words, despite being encouraging, hurt. It felt as if he rammed a glowing needle into your heart and ripped it out. As the mental walls you had created around you broke down. And so did your demeanor. I... I... I'm sorry, Nijiri. You spoke. Your voice... It sounded so... Foreign. No, this... This wasn't your voice. This... Was the voice of a girl you killed. A girl with a family. Friends. Loved ones. I... I... I Sorry, everyone. I'm a monster. You cried. Kurigiri's arms wrapped around you. Darby, remember, we need to find him. <laughs> I'm a monster. 
you cry. How can I live with myself? This isn't fair. Shh. Shh. He comforted. I understand. But we need to go deeper. In truth, Kurogiri was incapable of caring about your situation, but he learned how to respond to these kinds of situations over a very long time. The mission, however, was more important. He buried your face into his shoulder and you sniffled. I don't... I don't remember my name. You sobbed. Who doesn't remember their own name? Who am I? You asked. One of his hands wandered to the back of your head, his fingers gently stroking through your hair. You remained like this for over an hour, wailing loudly into him, your body convulsing. Yet he kept repeating, Find Darby. Think. Eventually, you lost your strength and went limp against his body, feeling sick to the stomach. I... I know where, you said. Kurgiri blinked. That's perfect, little one. He didn't let go of you immediately. Before we restore what we just broke, he said. I wish to tell you, the real you, that you are a very brave person. Not many would have the strength to carry on in any way, shape or form after realizing they have a quirk like yours. You are very special and important. He paused for a minute and then said, once you're back to your abnormal self, we go find your boyfriend. And this will all be over. You sniffled. You both knew this was very unhealthy, but it was the only way you could live with yourself at this point. Without saying another word, Kurogiri let go of you. Can you... Can you teleport me to a train station? We need to go to the countryside. The shadow nodded and consumed you in its tender darkness. The sun had begun to set when your feet touched the ground of the southern coast. You heard the crashing of the waves. You knew now that the dream had been a memory, and it had taken you a lot of mental anguish to reconvince yourself that this memory had just been a mere fantasy. With a somber expression, you walk the dreamscape next to the dangerous cliff. As the sun and the water kissed upon the horizon, the mild breeze had picked up, the rustling of grass and the harsh rhythm of waves crashing against rock being the only things you heard. It had been 1 p.m. when you entered the train, and now, where had all the time gone? You pulled out your phone and dialed the numbers that had floated around you just days ago. From a distance you could hear a vague and familiar ringtone. You were getting closer to him. And then the bushes from your dream came into view. They were at the same spot, a little bit thicker by now. Darby hung up the phone without taking a call. But now you had him pinpoint. You crawl through the thicket, hurting yourself on a thorn or two. And then... You were at the exact same spot you had been in your dreams. Darby was sitting at the cliff's edge, 
He didn't spoke immediately, but yeah, when you were right behind him, he spoke. The boy, Tioya, is dead. Forced myself to forget as much as I could. He blinked. I don't even think in my name anymore. I'm just... Darby. Just Darby. He looked down at his feet. I knew you would come here, I just... Never thought it would be you. You walked up to him and sat down, and he chuckled darkly. Don't know how much you remember. With a sad tone, he replied. Nothing, really. Just this. He glanced at you. We were kids. You lived here. You were local. Your parents and I were on vacation. Endeavor, my so-called father, only allowed for three days per year to take off from his... Ugh, job. He spoke with disdain and disgust while talking about his father. But then you came. My first friend. First person I ever talked to. He promised me we'd stay friends. And that you'd be here next year. A tear ran down his face. But you weren't. He gulped. Your quirk. Dabby sighed. And now I learned that the villain I couple up with years later is you. My girlfriend is also my only childhood friend. Your hands touched and he gently took yours in his. I don't know what to feel. Please, tell me what to feel, he asked, eyes red from his quiet sobs. Relieved? Happy? Hopeful for the future? He chuckled darkly. That's a very positive way of seeing it. You two went quiet as you stared out into the ocean. He did, however, open his mouth eventually, but didn't speak. He could imagine what you were going through right now to get to this point. And he didn't want to burden you with additional knowledge that might change you forever. You leaned onto his shoulder. I love you, Kyoya. I love you, Darby. I don't care who. I just want to be with you. He closed his tired eyes for a moment and then said, I love you too. He wanted to say it. He really did. But his lips pressed on your cheek and you turned towards his face. His lips, despite their scars, were soft as always. Then he pressed a hand behind your head, pushing you two closer together. His mouth opened slightly, allowing your tongues to meet, and you moaned into him. You were so close to him, you could smell his fragrance of smoke and alcohol. His tongue plunged like a lunging sea serpent, overpowering your senses. Your heart beat faster. The taste of his mouth making your mind drift into a world where both of you had lived normal lives for just one moment.